Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to session 10 of the Zebra Inflation Drivers and Dynamics webinar. My name is Rafael Schöne, and I'm one of the organizers of this webinar series on behalf of the Central Bank Research Association, Dominic Smith, the other co-organizer. This special session is jointly organized with the Center for Inflation Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Without much ado, let me pass on the virtual stage to Ina Hajdini from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, who will be today's moderator. Ina? Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for signing up. Uh, the topic of today's session is on expectations, conflicts, and spirals. As usual, many thanks to the organizers, Raphael Schoenland, Dominic Smith. Before we get started, let me touch a little bit on a few of housekeeping items. So today's special webinar will be lasting for about an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to start off with a 55 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute discussion and then a 10 minute Q&A session at the very end. Attendees do not have the option to switch on their audio and video, but are more than welcome to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. They can, of course, pose their questions during the presentations already and do not have to wait until the end. I will then select questions to be answered in the Q&A session uh, part of the webinar after the presentation. The webinar will be live streamed via the Zebra YouTube channel, recorded and then made available on the Zebra website and Zebra YouTube channel after the event. And finally, as a disclaimer, we should say that participation in a Zebra webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation or favoring endorsement of the views, opinions, products or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any other participating institution, individual or entity. All views expressed during a Sibra or Sibra co-hosted event are strictly those of the authors, discussants, and other participants, and not those of Sibra, the co-sponsoring institutions, or any other participating institution. And now, without uh, much ado, I have the pleasure to pass on the virtual floor to our speaker, Ivan Werning, who is a professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Ivan, whenever you're ready, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ina, and thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's wonderful to present this work. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a, a presentation that's based on some recent work, um, but I'm going to try and combine uh, three papers. So let me see if I can get this uh, going here. OK, I hope uh, you can see me now. I'm not sure. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I have a backup computer here because I had been having some trouble. Um, and so let me try and share the screen here and and do this again. Okay, so um, okay, so okay. So if uh, let me know if you can't hear me or you can't see me. I can't really see myself, so I don't know. Um, we can hear you and see you, so all good to go. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to try and run through three papers, which may be a little ambitious, um, but I think there's some connections that make that uh, efficient. And I'll give you a bird's eye view. And um, it's these three papers. And if anything, I will, you know, knowing uh, the limitations of time, uh, aim to cover the first for few two, the first two, which are more conceptual, and then. Um, you know, if, 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 if jump to the, the, the results of the last one. Okay, so do the first two in a little more detail. All right, so, um, so let me talk, talk first about the role of expectations in, uh, in inflation, okay? So this is a question that I think I can frame this way. So I think a lot of people have in mind the idea that inflation is affected by other things, in particular, maybe aggregate demand or other factors, okay? And, um, but in addition, it's affected and perhaps one for one uh, with inflation expectations, okay? And what I'm gonna do in this paper is kind of call that a myth, say that that's not actually uh, true in general and, um, and, and put some you know, doubts on, on this idea, right? So in particular, what I'm gonna wanna do is think about what the right effect of inflation expectation is on inflation and in a very simple manner, think of it as adding a coefficient here, and I'm gonna be investigating this coefficient. 
which sometimes I'll call the pass through from inflation expectations to inflation, right? So what is going to be my approach in this paper to, to talk about that pass through? I'm gonna revisit uh, some standard models that we have in mind um, that macroeconomists use, some time dependent uh, nominal rigidity models, Calvo, Taylor, et cetera, and also some state dependent menu cost models. And I'm gonna look at the optimal pricing in these models and aggregate up. And then importantly, and this is maybe the big step of this paper for me, was you know, to allow an arbitrary inflation expectation. And then I'm gonna study how firms are behaving given that and the resulting inflation we see in the aggregate as a result of that. So it's really gonna be uh, applying the concept of a temporary equilibrium that's used sometimes in the learning literature. Um, and, um, and, and so that's, that's how we're gonna get at the fee. So again, in a nutshell, uh, for much of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about this fee. And of course, there are, I'm gonna set aside the other factors affecting inflation, okay? When I'm discussing this paper. Um, then I'm gonna do something a little more elaborate and, show, and break up the inflation expectation in different horizons and also look at the effect of past inflation, okay? Um, so we'll get to that. And I'll offer a, a, a Phillips curve that I think is superior to the way we think about this or we teach this, all right? All right, so that's, that's what I'm gonna do this paper. Just to fix ideas, what I'm gonna do here is extremely simple once you think about doing it. And then it, it's all downhill from there. I mean, once this is a paper, I've written papers that, where the question is what everyone's asking and then it's just really hard to get to the answer. This is the reverse. It's once you figure out what the question is, it's very easy to find the answer. So basically everyone's looked at in these models what the effect is of a marginal cost shock. It suddenly permanently rises. Think of the pass through literature with respect to exchange rates. What I'm doing in this paper is somewhat similar but different. I'm looking at a shock that from the point of view of firms is changing the slope of future marginal costs. And I'm just computing what the implications are of that, okay? And tracing them out. And this is extremely simple, but just had not been done uh, in the way I'm doing it here. So the way I'm gonna do this again to fix ideas is I'm gonna have a black, black box for expectations and I'm gonna have, see how that affects price setters. Everything I do here is gonna be analogous for a model where you think about wage setting, uh, but I'm gonna focus on price setting. And then I'm gonna calculate what inflation is, okay? Things I'm not gonna do are equally important to what I do. So let me tell you, I'm not gonna be modeling expectations. That's super important. There's a great literature on that theory and empirical. I'm not gonna be doing that, okay? I'm gonna treat it as a black box. I'm also not gonna be adding all the other elements of a macro model. That's great to do. I've done it in other papers. I don't wanna do that today. Today, I wanna to focus on, on this uh, row here, okay? And I think the advantage of doing that is you can port my results to any different setups you have. So you might want to model expectations one way, someone might want to model expectations another way, we might have different ways of modeling the rest of the model, et cetera. So everything I do today, I think is more portable. Think of it like you know a chip that you can plug into your own computer, okay? And I think the contributions of the paper is to ask what this simple pass-through of inflation expectation is. People had done, temporary equilibrium in the learning literature, but they typically do not ask this question. They don't think of this simple metric. They also typically, because they're doing a lot of heavy lifting with other things, just assume a Cabo model. Whereas I, here I'm gonna look at a wide, wide set of models. And I think that's gonna be very important. And finally, I'm gonna be able to ask the difference between short and long run expectations. Okay, so let me jump right into it and, and, and refine this question a little bit. So I wanna look at the pass through from inflation expectations to inflation. I obviously have to hold fixed other stuff and it matters how you hold it fixed. So here's what I'm, I'm gonna do. And I think this makes sense. I'm gonna look at inflation expectations, how they move, holding fixed everything that, I, that we wanna think of as real, okay? And that means real quantities and also real relative prices. So I'm gonna hold fixed from the perspective of the firm, all their views about real quantities and real relative prices and focus on what happens if they suddenly think the nominal stuff is gonna grow faster than they thought before, okay? And I think that's, that's a very natural way of posing this question. Now, must first uh, highlight that there's a, a, a lot of confusion in, in thinking about this. People use, for example, the New Keynesian Phillips curve, which is very well known. So I just put it up here. 
And they note the beta here is close to one. So they think, okay, that looks like inflation expectations has almost a one for one effect on inflation. Okay, we can, I'm gonna always approximate things. If they're close enough to one, I'll call them one, okay? However, that's wrong because if you solve forward, we can also write inflation this way as the present value of output gaps. And what would we say now? In, on, in the last equation, inflation expectations don't even appear. So would we say that the pass through is zero? So we, you know, we have two answers, near one and zero, and which one is it? Well, none of them. Looking at a model, once it's solved in its rational expectation form does not allow you to answer this question. You need to step back and, and solve the model without imposing rational expectations, okay? Because once you impose rational expectations, inflation expectations and output gaps are tied at the hip and you cannot move them independently. All right, there's other reasons for studying non-rational expectations, which you know, uh, many people pursue, myself included, which is that you know, sometimes we consider uh, other expectations more, more, more realistic. All right, but for this question even, it just doesn't get to the answer. So now let me go through the answers I find. Okay, so roughly I'm gonna show that in the Calvo model, you do get a pass through one, but you know, not, not through that reasoning, through some correct reasoning, okay? So people had the right answer for the wrong reasons. But then I'll show you that a basic model like Taylor, that I think is actually very descriptive of, of a ton of goods, think of, you know, services, you know, many products are, you know, reviewed their prices once a year or something, think of Apple, um, et cetera, et cetera, Netflix. So, you know, you have uh, the Taylor model, which I think we mostly abandoned because it was more tractable to work with a couple model. That has a much lower pass-through, about a half. And then I'm gonna talk about the general time dependent and go into menu costs. I'm gonna do this very simple because of time. Uh, so let me try and argue it uh, with a figure. Okay, so here's a Taylor model. Let's start with that. And imagine prices are set for a whole year, okay? And imagine the firm thinks that the prices are gonna be rising like the black line, okay? And let's abstract from the markup and, 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 and the real marginal costs here. Those are just constants. So abstracting from that, the firm would like to set their price equal to the black line. So to follow the trend, that's the trend they expect. They don't know if it's true, but that's the trend they expect but they can't, they have to set a price that's fixed for a whole year. So where do they wanna set, uh, set it, okay? So the idea is they make a compromise and they set it so that on average it's okay, right? And that has the important implication that when they set a firm that's resetting their price, if they think the slope is higher, imagine the slope initially was zero and it grew to 10%. Now, how does the firm price? Well, it, it prices at a higher level because it's overshooting Initially, it's, it's, it's choosing a blue line that's above the, the, the current value of the black line. And that's the, that's the way expectations affect inflation, okay? Because some firms will be overshooting. Looking forward, they, they set a price that's higher than their desired price today, okay? Now, intuitively here, you can see it. You know, if inflation was 10% for, throughout the year, they're gonna raise their price by 5% to, to reach the midpoint. And intuitively, that's then gonna give you a pass-through of one half, okay? I'm really, you know, giving you the very intuitive uh, reasoning. Uh, you might have some questions about this. I'll come back to, to, to sort of establishing this uh, more credibly, okay? But now let's think of the Cabo model. In the Cabo model, I wanna think of a spell that on average is just like the blue one. So also a year, but uh, spells in Cabo are random. So you might get a very short spell uh, or you might get a very long spell. And I'm gonna set them up so that on average, they're equal to the blue spell. Okay. Now you see here then that if you got the short spell and you chose the same overshoot as with Taylor, you would regret your choice. You would have wished to choose a lower price, okay? Not to overshot as much. However, if you get the long spell, it's the reverse. You wish you had overshot more at your price. And what, what do you do then on average if, if, if you have these two possibilities, a short and a long spell? Well, it turns out that the long spell matters more to you. That the error you make with a long spell is much worse than the one you make with a short spell. And the reason is that what you care about are these integrals. Those, are, those measure how far your profits are from the ideal profit. And so you're really gonna pay more attention to the possibility of this long tail and that's gonna lead you to overshoot the price more. And that's why Calvo has a bigger uh, uh, pass-through than Taylor. And in fact, it has a pass-through of around one, okay? All right, 
So now let me tell you what I do to establish these things more formally and also to do them much more generally. So I look at the time dependent model, a, a general time dependent model. And in fact, in the background, I'm gonna allow for complementarities across firms, uh, general co marginal costs, general production functions. Uh, they're not necessarily linear labor. The demand curves can be general, they're sort of pinball or more general, et cetera, et cetera, all right? But the main thing I wanna stress is for this time dependent model, a main input, a main uh, primitive is uh, the hazard rate. So I'm gonna take any hazard rate uh, as a function of how old your price is. Now the Cabo case is a special case where that hazard rate is constant and the Taylor is a special case where that hazard rate is zero, 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 zero until you get to change your price and it jumps to one, okay? Now in a time dependent model like this, I wanna stress that there are two distributions of duration of price spells that we can think about. One is that you wait until a spell it gets completed and you write down how long it took. And then you do that for many spells and then you, you plot a histogram. And that would be the distribution of completed durations. Okay? And we could think of the average duration from that histogram. Another thing though you can do is walk in randomly on a store and point at a good and ask how long is that price been around? How old is that price? And write that down, do that for many goods, and then draw a histogram and take the average. That would be the average duration of ongoing price spells. They are not the same. I think we get used to thinking they're the same. Uh, some people know this, but they're not the same. They're only the same in the Calvo case, right? And so my result is going to say that this pass-through is intimately related to the, to the relationship between these two average durations. Again, so I'm gonna always write this inflation in this way and all the markup stuff, shocks, all the real marginal costs are gonna be soaked up by the A. I'm not gonna talk about it today. I'm gonna to focus on fee. Okay. And the main result is this simple result that says that the pass-through is the ratio of the ongoing duration to the completed duration. Okay. And I think this result is nice uh, because it's so simple and also maybe because it has uh, you know, empirical possibilities. Right? although there are some challenges thinking about heterogeneity and such. But now also it's easy because you can think of the Cabo case. In the Cabo case, the ratio of these two things is one because they're you know, ongoing and complete durations have the same distribution. But in the Taylor case, it's equal to a half. Why? Because whenever you walk into a store and point at a, a, a good, you on average get uh, find that good to be halfway through the duration it's gonna have, okay? So that's why you get a half. So basically the ongoing average duration is one half of the completed one, right? This also proves incidentally, you could show that this proves that phi is always greater or equal to a half. So Taylor actually attains the minimal pass-through for a time-dependent model, okay? And I think a little more uh, nerdily, you can show that, you know, it's possible to have a pass-through above one if uh, you have the right hazard function, okay? All right, now let me jump into uh, something more detailed. So in the previous result, I assumed that inflation expectations was some constant. You just had a slope, okay? Now I'm gonna imagine that you have some inflation expectations that depends on the horizon. So you might think the next six months inflation will be 5%, then it's gonna go down to 4%, then it's gonna go down to three to two and stay at two, kind of like the Fed is promising, all right? Um, that might be your belief, okay? Or it might be something else. Again, I'm allowing anything arbitrary. I'm not imposing rational expectations. Also, I'm gonna allow uh, the effect of past uh, inflation, and I'm gonna study that. So I didn't tell you before, but before I was looking at the case where in the past we've had zero inflation, a common assumption, and then uh, looked at a shock to expectations. Now I'm gonna allow for the fact that in the past there might've been some inflation, and it could be anything. So the second sum here is showing you, the, it's, it's adding up over negative S, so it's looking at past realized inflation rates. Okay, so it's already a result to show you can write it this way, but I'm not gonna dwell on that, okay? And again, the A is capturing and soaking up all the real stuff, okay? Real marginal costs, real markups, et cetera. All right, so the main result is that these fees are always positive, which is very intuitive. If you have higher inflation expectations, then you will you know, create more, you will get more inflation because people will overshoot more, okay? And, but these coefficients are declining so it, it, that means that it, having high expectations in the short run 
has more of an effect on inflation having, having high inflation in the long run. Okay? In fact, this uh, coefficient goes to zero pretty fast. In particular, it's zero, exactly zero, outside the range where your prices are sticky. So suppose that most of your prices are going to be sticky for two years. Then you don't care at all about inflation in year three. Okay? And that's kind of so obvious once you think about it, because why would a firm care? I mean, they're going to be able to reset their price in two years or earlier. So today they don't have to worry about what inflation is going to be doing in three years. However, obviously this goes against, you know, the common reflex of, of focusing on long run expectations. Right? I just want to caveat that that does not mean long run expectations are not important. They may be important for other reasons, but for this equation, they're not. Okay? And finally, I show that these coefficients, the future and past ones add up to one, okay? So that's to say that in the long run, you could have any steady state inflation, even if the A is zero, okay? So it's kind of like saying the Phillips curve is vertical, right? All right, so that is important because as I lower the effect of future inflation, I lower the fees on future inflation, which I'm trying to argue we should be thinking about, it will increase the coefficients on past inflation. So we will get um, you know, inertia from inflation. We will get intrinsic inertia. Not inertia because expectations are inertial, actual inertia, okay? So this is not necessarily a dovish paper. It's not saying don't care about it, inflation expectations or don't care, you know, it's, it's putting a damper on the idea that inflation expectations have such a big effect. But the flip side of that is now we really care if we ever, if we, if we do experience inflation because that will make it, will have a persistent effect. So, you know, you have to think of it, uh, things more subtly. All right. Um, I should say there's a very nice paper by uh, Sheedy that develops the Phillips curve uh, uh, in, in a general form for a time-dependent model, but it's very different from this because he imposes rational expectations, okay? Uh, so the A is different, but also those coefficients are completely different. In fact, he finds basically a, a, a fee that's near one for the first horizon, but then is like negative for future horizons. And that sounds weird, but that's because when you impose rational expectations, Again, everything is tied at the hip. So you get kind of these results that are very close to the new Keynesian Phillips curve. All right. Let me uh, move a little quick there and say, I also explored menu cost models. Um, I don't wanna give you the de as much detail now about this, just to say that these models, what I found is if you solve the impact effect on inflation, you get very weird things, okay? So I'm gonna try and convey that a little more intuitively. Basically an SS model, a menu cost model has this, these bands uh, that the firm is using to choose when to change prices. And if firms believe they, that inflation is going to be higher, if we think of Shashinsky wise in particular, they prove that the bands are going to expand. Well, let me cut to the chase and say that implies, okay, that if suddenly firms believe that, that prices, inflation is going to be higher, they will expand their bands and no one's going to be changing prices for a while. So inflation is going to drop to zero, okay? So this is kind of weird. I, I don't want to trust this result too much, but it shows that menu cost models can have very, very different uh, properties. Okay? So I also look at a you know, mo model that has idiosyncratic shocks, like Golos of Lucas and so on, and it kind of can go the other way, give you a very high pass through, all right? But all these results are on impact in continuous time. When you average them out over a quarter, you get something more sensible. So here I've done that. And the Shashinsky Weiss case looks like this blue curve. And you do see that initially inflation becomes negative. So, you know, the impact effect is, is downward. And the black line is more like a Golosov Lucas reaction. But I just want you to focus what happens after a whole quarter, which is, you know, at one here. And the cumulative effect is roughly between 0.5 and 1. Okay. So you end up with something between Taylor and Calvo again, right? Okay. So let me end up with something a little uh, more radical. And uh, so I think that was exploration of traditional uh, st sticky price models, but I wanna end up with something with a question that I have, which is, do we think this is realistic? If I think of the menu cost model, do I think it's realistic that when expectations change, firms shift their policy rules? And I wanna kind of argue, no, that we should think about frictions in planning what these bands are and in executing them. Do firms really stop changing prices, for example, in that example I gave you in Shashinsky Weiss? Probably not. They already have the machines to change the prices. They already hired the person. They probably wouldn't, you know, uh, all of a sudden stop changing prices. There are, you know, short run effects. 
And then do firms really want to change their bands? Do they really, you know, are so preoccupied with that? I want to argue that no. It, to me, fixed bands as a, would be a natural rule of thumb. If I'm a manager having a fixed band saying, I want my price to be plus minus 5% around this markup, seems quite robust. Then maybe I'll refine that in a very high inflation environment. But I think I want to think about what would happen if they just adopted a fixed band. And what would happen is trivial, but very important. You would get a pass through of zero, okay? Because basically, if they're using the same band, even though their expectations changed, then there will be no effect on inflation. And I want to motivate that this, I want to motivate this further. So what I'm going to argue is, look, when we teach menu cost models, we teach them in, do we really think that the cost of changing a price is the cost of a sticker? No, we often say, no, it's think of it not so literally as manager time. But if you think about manager time, then you should think about the cost of, uh, of, of deciding what a new band is for, for prices, okay? And giving those orders, you'd go into Zoom meetings that last hours with headquarters. Uh, so I think it's natural to explore a model where you have a cost of changing the bands. And I call that MC squared in honor of a famous formula. Okay, so, so what I'm plotting here, just to uh, give you an example, is what would happen? How, uh, so what would happen is it, if you have a cost of changing the bands, that means that if the inflation expectation moves a little bit, then you're not gonna change your bands, okay? And what I'm showing you here is an example, calibrated actually, that says if the cost of manager time of changing the band is 10 times the cost of changing a particular good, which I think is a sensible range, maybe we don't know much about this range, but then even a change in expectations of 12% for inflation would not trigger a change in the bands, okay? So you would get fee of zero for a, for a moderate range of changes in, in inflation expectations. What I like about this idea is also it would imply that if you have a big change in inflation expectations, then you would trigger these changes in bands and you would get a, a, an effect on inflation, okay? So taking stock, inflation expectations are less powerful, okay? All right, so I'm gonna switch now to my second uh, paper here um, and talk about conflict, okay? So this is, um, I wouldn't say myth busting in this case, but it is a paper that, you know, uh, I think has at least widened my thinking about relative to sort of how tr traditionally I've been taught and thinking about inflation, okay? Um, so this is a paper and I just released it online, um, but it was born out of, you know, some work that we'd done earlier with Guido. This is joint with Guido Lorenzoni. And what we do in this paper is two things, okay? Um, the paper describes a little more uh, the literature and a lot of uh, things like that that I think are interesting that I won't have time to talk about. But let me tell you concretely what we have to offer, okay? So the conflict idea is not new, but I think we will have some important contributions. And also the conflict idea is not so well known among you know, mainstream mac macroeconomists, okay? Um, so we're gonna do two things that I think are useful. First, we're gonna provide a very bare bones model, a, 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 a stylized model that I'm gonna use for intuition reasons. I don't want you to think of this model as super realistic or anything. It's purposely unrealistic, but it's not gonna have any money. It's not gonna have any credit. No one can save or borrow at any interest rate. There's no interest rates. There's no output. The amount of goods is an endowment. Um, and so there's no monetary policy and there's no natural rate of output and there's no natural rate of employment. And yet I'm gonna find that there is inflation. And so you won't be able to seek refuge in your traditional ideas that inflation is because we're printing too much money or we have too low interest rates, or maybe some would say too high interest rates uh, or that the natural rate of output is lower than the current output level or anything like that. You won't be able to say that. And I think this model is gonna isolate and, and force you to think about conflict. And so it's a shock to the system, I would say. It, for me, it's a useful model to kind of break my own. You know, I was also uh, brought up thinking about these traditional ideas. And this at least puts you on seeds of seed, seed of doubt that, that, there, that there might be some other things we need to think about. Then the second model, but I don't wanna get too far ahead, is gonna be a more traditional model that's gonna create a bridge between the conflict view and modern macroeconomic traditional models, okay? And I think that's gonna be useful for people to wanna think about conflict and to adopt that view uh, in, 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 the, in, in, 
in macroeconomics, okay? And what we're gonna show is that conflict inflation is not a different form of inflation, it's just the most proximate cause of inflation and it's, it's, it's dwelling there in all our models, okay? So that's gonna be our perspective, which is a little different than sometimes the way conflict inflation is discussed. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna push this idea, okay? So let me spell out the model, but do it in a very graphical form. So the model is, you know, there's discrete periods, okay? Oh, let me also just say again, it's a very stylized model. Um, and this model, I don't know if I can say this, you know, obviously this is an aspiration, it may not be right, but you know, I think many very simple models that are not realistic have been useful, okay? So one model I have in mind is let's say uh, Kiyotaki Wright. If I wanna think of Kiyotaki Wright, I'm not gonna use it for everything in macro, but it's gonna be useful for thinking of double coincidence of wants and things like that. So likewise, this model is gonna be built in that manner with very extreme assumptions to be able to think about conflict. Okay, so here's the model. Imagine we start at period one and in period one, um, oh, and in every period it's gonna be the same. There's some endowment of goods. Agent A owns good A, think of it as apples and agent B owns good B, think of it as bananas. And they trade, they wanna trade. They both have preferences over these goods. And I'm gonna assume preferences are symmetric in, this, in the following sense, that they both care about uh, their good the same way, and they care about the other good the same way, okay? All right, so that's not important. The important thing is if prices are gonna be set up in a staggered fashion. So at time one, A is gonna to get to choose a price. So I'll call a price that's new P star. So I'm gonna call P star one, it's gonna be the price of A at time one, all right? At time B, remember at time B, uh, so at time B, the, the, the agent B is gonna get a chance to change their price, okay? Remember initially in time one, the price of B was not set. It was, they were using an old price, okay? So they were using the price at time zero. So that's the sense in which prices are set for two periods for each agent. And then this just repeats itself. So agent A again gets to set the price and so on. And I, we do something more general in the paper, but let's think of the person setting the price as the seller, okay? And then the buyer is gonna be the other agent. So in period one, it's gonna be agent B. And in period two, it's gonna be agent A, okay? And the important thing, what I mean by buyer is that uh, the buyer is gonna to get to go and make a take it or leave it offer to the other agent on the quantities, but they're gonna trade at the prevailing posted prices. So in particular, in period one, agent B is gonna use the ratio, is gonna think of the relative price of the ratio between the newly set price that A has just set and agent B's old price. Okay? And he's gonna make an offer on quantities. And that's the sense in which it looks like a buyer. If you imagine that in equilibrium, and this turns out to be right, you know, the offer they wanna make anyway is accepted, then this is basically like thinking of a buyer and a seller. Okay? And then in period two, the roles reverse and so on, okay? So the key thing is you're using posted prices that are staggered and you're trading uh, in, this, in, this, in this fashion. Note that the trade then is gonna be completely barter, okay? So what I have in mind, and I should have said this earlier, there really literally are two agents, A and B, okay? I'm not saying there are thousands of agents A or thousands of agent B, you can think that way also. But in that case, I wanna imagine that we've already paired one agent A with one agent B, and now we're always talking about these two, okay? We do have a generalization in the paper to think about random matching, and, and it is interesting, but I won't have time for that, okay? So for now, I think there's just two agents in the economy, A and B, okay? And this is the way they trade. So it's fully spelled out. And then the other thing I wanna emphasize is, it's like an Edgeworth box. So in every period, there's this Edgeworth box, there would be a competitive equilibrium, um, but instead they're using these, these prices that were set staggeredly and agent, you know, and there's one agent that's acting as a buyer always. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the key idea, all right? And that means that I don't need to introduce money that, so that the, the, the barter is a trick to think of not having to have money. I don't have to have credit and hence there's no roll up for interest rates and there's no monetary policy like I promised, okay? And because these are endowments, there's no output choice or, or, or labor choice, okay? So what happens in this model, if you solve it, it's very simple, it's in the paper, you can read it 
one thing I like about this is also very easy, very, very simple to, to, to solve. You're gonna find that inflation, that the rate of, of say every period, uh, the, the newly set price is gonna, is gonna be growing at a constant rate. And the reason for that, and the logic of that is, is, is the following. Let me, let me back up and give you the logic of it. Let's go back to period one. In period one, agent A is setting the price. And now agent B's price is fixed in the past and I've normalized it to one. So effectively agent A is controlling the relative price. However, agent B is controlling the quantity. So from the perspective of agent A, the situation for this period is purely the you know, like a monopolist, he faces some demand curve, okay? And he knows that he's gonna sell more and get more of the other good if he, if he uh, has a lo uh, um, lower price, okay? But if he has a higher price, he might have to give up less of his good. So it's a monopoly problem, uh, a little non-standard because it's not a firm versus a consumer, but this monopoly problem leads to the very intuitive thing that then this agent wants a high relative price, in particular, higher than the competitive equilibrium. And if you, if you were to impose a lot of symmetry, the comparative equilibrium would have a relative price of one. So I'm trying to give you an intuition why you should expect the relative price that's higher than one. And that means that the agent is gonna set a relative price that's higher than, than the previous agent had set. And this is as true at time one, but also at time two, at time three. So that just means you're gonna get this constant rate of inflation. I wanna stress something that's not completely obvious and it's all in the math, you know, but it's very simple. I, I, I just explained the result as if the model was static, but it's not. But it turns out that agent A, when they're choosing their price, even though they're choosing a price for period one and two, they know that the effect of their price in period two is irrelevant because when two, period two comes around, it's gonna be agent B's choice to make a price and he's gonna control the relative price. So from the perspective of agent A in period one, when it's setting the price, it only cares about what happens in period one, because in period two, higher price is just gonna be met with a higher price from B to get to the same relative price. So this model is kind of, in that beautiful way, just breaks down into a static model, right? right. I'm gonna, in the model, there's an extension that breaks that, and then you get more to our familiar territory where you need to think about the expectations and you need to think about the future, and that's done as an extension of this model in the paper. But the key thing I wanna highlight is you get inflation here in a model without money, without interest rates, with barter, okay? And the main intuition is what I said, it's like the seller is acting as a monopolist against some demand function, okay? All right, and so I think this is a contribution because it's, it's a simple model, it's fully spelled out. It is an intuition and it, it, for, for where inflation is coming from, it's coming from uh, the idea that they wanna exercise market power and a way of saying that is that they want to have different relative prices. They both want to have a higher relative price, but that's impossible. Either the, the relative price for A is above one or the one for B is above one. And what's happening here is on average, no one's winning respect to relative price. They're fluctuating in, in terms of relative price. But the effect of that tug of war is to create uh, inflation in, in absolute terms. Okay. So that's uh, the intuition. And again, I think the also the, the, the benefit that should be stressed is because we don't have money and we don't have interest rates, you cannot interpret easily this result in terms of standard uh, stories. So it leaves you with a notion, I think, of conflict in that sense that inflation is arising because people want different relative prices. Okay. All right. So, like I said, there are extensions of this in the paper, but I want to go to the general framework now that we develop, which is going to be a framework, the second part of the paper. It's not a stylized model. It's gonna be actually the reverse. It's gonna be a model that is a framework that is going to nest a lot of traditional macro models, okay? So I'm not against having money or having credit. Um, that was just to isolate something. This model is actually gonna be a framework that's all encompassing. And, um, and this framework is, is, is gonna, what it's gonna do is, is, is take what many models already have, let's say New Keynesian models, Ursig et al, um, and, but, but grab the, the, the uh, subset of those uh, aspects of the model. So it's gonna be, a, I'll call it a framework. Think of that as an incomplete model. Um, and through the lens of that framework, we can think of, of a bunch of models, but also um, I think do something useful that transcends all these models, okay? So let me put again, an analogy that, you know, is only an aspiration. Of course, in this case, I'm pretty sure impossible. 
But think of solo growth accounting. I mean, it's a thing that's useful for whatever growth model you have in mind, okay? And so, and it doesn't spell out the whole model. It doesn't need to tell you how people save. It just tells you, let's do these calculations. And it's been hugely ins insightful. And, uh, and, and, and so what I'm gonna do is similar, okay? Think of that for, for, for inflation. And what I'm gonna do here is most similar to what the literature, the post-Keynesian literature does when they speak of conflict inflation. But what I'm gonna do is the, in the analysis is, 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 is gonna significantly extend uh, those analysis, all right? In particular, we're gonna think of non-stationary situations and we're gonna think of expectations in different ways and so on. Okay, so let me get to the bottom of this. So here's the framework. Now I will have consumption and labor and I will have hence prices and wages. And I'm gonna think of the price that's, the, the wage that's reset in logarithmic terms as equal to the price plus some constant that you can think of as the real wage workers want at this moment, uh, a worker that's resetting their, their wage. And the price likewise is gonna be, uh, a, you know, in log terms, additive in the wage uh, with a constant that, that, that is going to represent the, the profits the firm is, is, is seeking. So F is, stands for firm, okay? Now we're working continuous time here uh, just to simplify, but basically that's gonna imply that the wage and the price are changing at this rate if we think that there's a fraction of people that are making uh, you know, flow of uh, lambda W, they're changing the wage, lambda P, they're changing the price. So this is kind of the Ursa and Henderson Levine uh, type setup that's been used in many, many models. So that's gonna apply with different notation and after substituting in that the, the, there's gonna be wage inflation uh, and there's gonna be price inflation. And wage inflation is the difference between G and the current real wage. So omega is the real wage here. And likewise, price inflation is gonna be the difference between an omega and F. So it's as if intuitively workers have some target G for the real wage. If they have a target above the wage that produces wage inflation, very intuitive. And likewise for firms with their profit uh, target, you can think of it that way. Now let's run through a few examples. We'll call a case here that's called, it's no disagreement. So imagine we started uh, just normalizing everything. Imagine we were in a steady state with zero inflation where both F and G were equal to zero and omega was equal to zero. That would prove zero inflation. And now imagine we, we consider a shock where no, F and G are not gonna be zero, but they're gonna be equal to each other. Okay, so F and G jump from being zero and omega is zero now, but F and G you know, do, uh, are jump variables. They jump to a new constant level um, and common constant level F, okay? So what is that gonna do? Well, you can see from the equation for, um, uh, for wage inflation, that that's going to increase wage inflation, okay? All right, and um, so, and, but it's gonna do exactly the opposite for price inflation, okay? So what you're gonna get, okay, here I did it the other way around, but the important point to make is it's always gonna push price and wage in opposite directions. So if we get a shock to the levels of F and G, but not to their difference, you're gonna get inflation in one, in one side, but not in the other, okay? So that's gonna be something that's gonna generalize. Instead, we're gonna think about an opposite case, a case where there's a lot of disagreement so that the shock pushes uh, F, but it does not push G. So G stays where it is. So this would be suddenly firms want higher profit margins, okay? Now this is gonna produce positive inflation, but also eventually it, it, it's, and, and more slowly produce wage inflation. Okay, so I'm showing you this dynamic. So, you know, it's this disagreement, that's what we call conflict here, that is producing inflation that appears in both places. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a result now uh, about that a little more in, in a little more detail. Yeah. Now, um, so what you can show is more generally, if F and G uh, stabilize somewhere, maybe not common, but they stabilize at some F and some G in the long run, then the real wage is gonna go somewhere in between F and G. Okay, and that's what this omega tilde is. And inflation and, and, and prices and wages are gonna to converge to each other and they're gonna to converge to this level here that I wanna stress, it depends on G minus F. And so that's the sense in which it's disagreement that produces long run inflation. This kind of example appears in, the, the, in, the, in, in many papers in the post keynesian literature, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is, is try and do something more general and in that spirit and show you the following. So I'm gonna define conflict inflation to be, um, to be this formula here that depends on the difference, the present difference between G and F, 
And I'm going to define adjustment inflation to be the present difference between W tilde and, uh, and sorry, omega tilde and omega, all right? So remember, omega tilde is, you know, a, a weighted average of F and G. So one of them is about the difference between G and F, and the other is kind of about the levels, all right? And the main result is that the real wage is different, its direction is driven by adjustment inflation, the pi A. So this is a decomposition, but um, the level of inflation, okay, is driven by conflict inflation. And one way to say that very simply is that a weighted average, and these weights have to do with the lambdas, okay, I, I think I, I defined them in a previous slide. A, a proper weighted average of wage and price inflation is always equal to conflict inflation. So this implies that unless you have positive conflict inflation, you cannot have positive wage and positive price inflation. So that's the sense in which conflict is inflation if we're speaking of generalized price and wage inflation. The other result I want to stress generalizes the steady states ideas. Imagine we take a, an average over time up to cap T and let's do that for a very long time. So let's approximate that with this limit. Okay. So we can do that for price and wage inflation. And what we show is that those averages for price and wage inflation are equal to the average of conflict inflation. Adjustment inflation doesn't matter for, the, for, the, for long, long enough averages of inflation. So another way to say that is if you see average or very persistent inflation, it's all driven by conflict, by differences between G and F, not by their levels. Okay, so conceptually, this is a conceptual paper. Uh, what I want to argue is that it's conflict is driving inflation in this sense. It's the difference between G and F. And that provides a window, a perspective that I think is very useful. That does not mean that previous theories are wrong or new theories that will come can't fit this uh, and, and that this is a particular theory in any way. On the contrary, it's a framework. So the way I like to think of it is that if, uh, the, the most proximate cause of inflation is conflict. And now you can write a particular model like a new Keynesian model where aggregate demand plays a role because it pushes employment up, it pushes uh, output up, and that pushes the real wage up. And, 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 and to me, that's just a story for how conflict is developing in that model, okay? And I find it useful, even if I'm gonna stick with the Nucasia model to have this other perspective. Um, and other things can affect conflict, okay? So I would argue, we argue in the paper that also expectations can affect conflict. Maybe if we have, instead of the new Keynesian model, we have a different model of, of, of the way wages are determined, maybe by unions or other institutions, we would also have to think of how that translates into conflict. But you see that it's a bigger umbrella. We can start fitting up more things, okay? Or we can think of real rigidities in wages, and I think this was done nicely by Blanchard and Gali, thinking about oil shocks. And that's a way to think about uh, those models is to think that those models were modeling the wage process in a way that departed from the new Keynesian model but that we're, we're another way of thinking about conflict. And you can think of future ideas. And you know, I think one thing about having this perspective, it's actually maybe a way to dream up uh, new ideas. Okay, I'm running out of time, I think. I started past uh, five minutes past, so uh, I guess I'm at the 45 mark. Uh, is that correct? Could, could you? That's right, yes. Okay, uh, let me know otherwise. I don't wanna go over time. So this, this, I think, is very important to stress. I think some authors, even in the post-Keynesian literature from which we are building, and, and I think it's very interesting literature, uh, sometimes do speak of conflict inflation as, as necessarily different. In my view, it's more an umbrella that can be different, and maybe in that sense, they're right, uh, but not necessarily. So to me, it's a, it's a useful concept, uh, whichever way you look at it, um, to explore things. All right. One thing we do also, uh, so one of the contributions of that accounting exercise is in these results is to stress conflict inflation quite generally um, and, 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 and push and extend the, the kind of steady state results that had been stressed in the literature. We also now look at expectations. So what, what we're gonna do is kind of an intermediate step. I'm not gonna model G from first principles. That would be a full model. We're gonna do that next in the third paper. But it, let me model G and F a little bit, okay? And let me say that G and F, the real wage you demand is affected by things that are like your, you know, your desire for real wages today and in the future, and also by what you expect prices to be, how they expect to behave, okay? So you have expectations about prices. And the idea is, uh, you know, let's focus on one of these. Let's say G, uh, what workers demand is going to be influenced by a, a, a gamma factor, which is how much you know their 
let's put that, let's think of that as their, their reservation wage or their marginal rate of substitution. For now, I'm gonna take that as exogenous. So it's one step towards endogenizing this. And then you could go another step and endogenize gamma. And I'm not gonna do that in the conflict paper, I'm gonna do it in the spirals paper. So taking gamma as given, what I am endogenizing here is that the G is, a, is kind of a weighted average of the gamma, but also it's gonna include the, the effect of inflation. So if workers think inflation is gonna be very high, when they get to change their wage, they're gonna demand a higher real wage today. They're gonna to do the overshooting we talked about earlier and completely analogously for, for firms. Okay, so going through this rather quickly, that implies that a steady state that the F is gonna be related to the, to the phi and the G to the gamma, but we're also gonna get an effect. So sorry, this is imagining everything was constant. Then we get the simple formula. And, and the point is to say that now it's not just the exogenous thing, but also this inflation expectation, okay? And conflict then is gonna be greater in situations where we have in, in expectations of inflation. So in this, under this view, the difference between G and F is gonna be an intrinsic difference between gamma and phi, but also contributed by inflation expectations, okay? Now we do in the paper also look at this. So this works for any expectations, much in line with the previous paper. We do also look at the benchmark of rational expectations, which again, I don't wanna advocate that rational expectations is the best model of expectations. Nothing, nothing would be further from my beliefs, but it, it is a baseline, it is a benchmark and is one that's used a lot. So it's of interest to study this model and now solve it out in the case of rational expectations. And we do that in the paper. Let me kind of spare you the details, but basically what we get is we're able to define conflict inflation and adjustment inflation in a way, so, so that now conflict inflation is purely exogenous. It depends on the gammas and the fees, okay? Uh, because we've solved out the contribution to, uh, that comes from in equilibrium having higher inflation expectations. Okay, so it's like a fixed point that we solve. And um, so once again, you, you see that if gamma were always equal to phi, conflict inflation would be zero. Okay? And then you have these coefficients, which I wanna stress very quickly. I like that I, it's written gamma times one minus, sorry, alpha times one minus alpha, where alpha is kind of the re how relatively sticky prices versus wages are. And that kind of speaks to the wage price problem I'm gonna go into now, because it's saying that the biggest effects for conflict inflation are when, you know, if we're given total stickiness when, when things are kind of equal, all right? Because then we get this feedback, right? So that's kind of suggestive, but I'm gonna go real quick here basi because basically what I have to say is that the same results I had before apply now to these definitions where we've solved out under rational expectations, the contribution from inflation expectation. Okay, so once again, these results just highlight the, the important role of conflict inflation, um, and, and, and our decomposition between adjustment and conflict highlight that conflict inflation is, is crucial for thinking of uh, long run, persistent and generalized inflation rates. Okay, wage price spirals. I, I think I am looking at the clock. Uh, I think I have five minutes, uh, six, but I'll take five. Okay, so what are we doing in this paper? Um, I anticipate I won't be able to give you as much here, but on some level it plugs into the previous one. That's what's nice. In fact, that's how we produced the previous paper I just talked about. We, we had started with spirals and then, you know, our, our ideas spiraled out and we wrote a second paper. Okay, so what is a uh, wage price spiral? I think it's a word that's used, that's not so clear. So one thing we just started in this project, what do we mean by that? Is it an alternative shock or, or some special model? We're gonna say no. Our definition is gonna be such that it's a mechanism that's at work in standard models. And then the idea is, can we think whether this mechanism is at work or strong by looking at which way the real wage is going? We're gonna say, no, not really. The, the total power of the mechanism uh, is, is, is not about that. And so does the direction the real wage go tell us something also about the underlying shocks? We've seen a lot of discussions nowadays. Uh, you know, if, uh, it's, if there's a wage, you know, if the real wage is going up, is that gonna produce a spiral? And we're gonna say, no, not necessarily. Or is that because of supply or demand? No, we're gonna say, no, not necessarily, okay? And then in the paper, we, we, we're developing some things about optimal policy in this framework. But I'm gonna uh, skip through that and say the following. This paper is way more, it's not as conceptual as the previous paper. It's way more related to current discussions. And one way to think about it is we, we write down a specific model that plugs into the conflict model. So we're doing what we promised. Conflict is this framework. Now you can think of specific models. And we think of a specific model that captures things that we think are important today. 
Um, in particular, we're going to have um, some standard models. Okay. Oh, this is repeated. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but we're going to have something I think is important, a supply constraint. So we're going to have the output is produced from labor, but also from some inputs that might be in, in, in constrained supply. Okay. And the mapping to the previous model is that here we're going to be spelling out a full model. And basically the G is going to end up being like the marginal rate of substitution. And the F is going to be looking like marginal product of labor. Okay. So I'm going to just regurgitate this. This is kind of the basic equations of the models, a utility function, a production function that captures labor and inputs, like I said. And labor is really a continuum of labor types so that we can think of wage setting. Okay, this is quite standard. But the bottom line is we get something similar to what I had before. People who are setting their price are looking at the wage they expect to have in the now and in the future. So there's this feedback between if they think inflation expectation and wages is high and the price they set today and their, what they expect their marginal product of labor to be. And, and the same thing for wages, okay? So here's a very, uh, uh, here's an interesting result, I think, which is suppose I shock for now the marginal rate of substitution and the marginal product of labor. Then basically this is using our conflict uh, algebra and, and you get these uh, regions. And I just wanna say, if you only shock the marginal rate of substitution, so suppose you push it up and that would happen if you think of a standard in Keynesian model where demand goes up, so then labor goes up, so then they, the workers demand a higher uh, real wage. Okay, so if you go along the vertical line, the green line is representing that the real wage is gonna go up. Okay, if instead you have a negative supply shock, okay, then you're gonna get that the real wage uh, falls and that's the blue region here, okay? Now, what we're gonna say is that intrinsic primitive shocks actually map into both, if it have effects both on marginal rates of substitution and marginal products of labor. And so what I'm going to do next is show you a, you know, a particular shock that I think is interesting and argue that we might be close to the, we might be in the blue region, but maybe close to the green region. And, you know, uh, and that could explain the, the real wage dynamics we've been observing. So uh, with uh, two minutes I have left, uh, did I go? No, I think, yeah, two minutes I have left. Uh, I'm going to do the following. So now we take the full model and we do a particular shock. So we basically, Think of an aggregate demand shock, or you can think that the Fed lowered its rate too much, uh, or you can think that you know the demand went up temporarily. So there's an AR1 that's capturing an aggregate demand shock, which is the, the, the first subplot here, it's just that's the shock. And then the reaction are the next three subplots. And what you see there is that price inflation is the blue line and it goes up immediately. And, and, um, and wage inflation goes up, but less than price inflation, okay? So as a result, the bottom, the, the lowest subplot shows that the real wage falls over time. And then eventually it starts recovering. And that's also shown again in the, in the second subplot here, where we see that at some point wage inflation becomes higher than price inflation. And what I wanna stress is the interesting thing here, I think, is that um, even though wage inflation now overtakes price inflation, it doesn't mean we have to be worried that that's going to produce a spiral that's going to create make price inflation go up again. In this model, we see that both are still heading towards zero. They just one just overtook the other. Okay, so this is kind of the optimistic view, if you like, of the you know perhaps the present situation. Okay, so this is like a soft landing view. All right. So I should. Um, all right. So and what's going on in the background is that why does this not produce a lot more inflation? Well, look. The wage was too low, so it needs to recover. And the supply shock is going away. The, the supply constraint is going away. And that's, that's this third subplot here, which is, is, is showing the price of that input, okay? Okay, in the paper, we show a condition. So whether the real wage goes up or down depends on parameters. And I think there's some insight that we develop on when you're in one case or the other. Let me say very briefly, because I want to end now. We also do a supply shock, so pure supply shock. And uh, that's the top sub, plan, uh, sub panel here, subplot here. And the other three plots are the same as before and actually look a lot similar to before. Again, we get higher price inflation, wage inflation that's positive, but lower than price inflation and eventually wage inflation that overtakes. The real wage initially falls, but then it catches up. And the logic is kind of similar. Um, and, and, and we think this is you know, speaking to this that I said that the behavior of the real wage doesn't really tell you whether it's supply or demand, okay? 
and it doesn't, and also you can have this optimistic view. All right, so I'm gonna skip uh, and just conclude here uh, saying, my view is inflation is messy. There's a lot of past wisdom, but we have to realize we haven't figured everything out and be more humble and work on that. Uh, and when we learn and acquire knowledge, sometimes we realize that some things we had were myths or we know less than we thought we did, uh, but that's still progress. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I'd like now to invite to the virtual stage our discussant, Philip Andrade, who is a senior economist and policy advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Philip, whenever you're ready. Yes. OK. So uh, do you see my slides? <clears throat> yes. yes. OK. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm very you know, glad to have the opportunity to first read all these uh, uh, very you know, super interesting papers and to you know, try to uh, make some comments uh, on this. So uh, of course, let me uh, start by saying that the usual disclaimer applies. So these views are my own and do not represent those of, of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston or the Federal Reserve System. So let me start by you know, trying to put um, you know, uh, the, the, the Ivan's contribution, Ivan and Guido's contribution into, you know, the context of what, what is being discussed at the Fed. <laughs> and so, of course, there is, um, you know, to start with, there was this very large, sudden and persistent uh, surge in U.S. inflation. Uh, just to, you know, give you some numbers, uh, refresh your memory. Uh, PC inflation was, uh, what, 0.7% in February 21. And then, you know, three months later, it was already four, more than 4%. And one year later, uh, one year and a half later, it, uh, it, it reached uh, 7%, okay? And so the question is what blocked us here? And so typically, you know, uh, the model that we use in central banks is as, uh, you know, uh, events also referred to is the new Keynesian Phillips curve, okay? And so, the main driver of inflation in this would be uh, the output gap uh, or shocks. <clears throat> and, and of course, you can have you know, some, some variation in inflation expectations, but you know, whenever they're on curve, this is not this is not the main driver. And, and the thing is that uh, you know, every uh, pre-COVID empirical studies were showing that this coefficient here. Uh, is super slow, so it's super small. So um, the Phillips curve is very flat. And so if you want to come up with, you know, a lot of inflation and a rapid surge in inflation uh, as the one that we've seen, then you need either, you know, incredible large uh, output gaps or very, very large shocks as well. And so, you know, there's a sense that uh, people are adopting that this is something that we can explain, I mean, uh, with, uh, with, this, uh, with this Phillips curve. And, and, and <clears throat> You know, there's this quote by uh, uh, the president of the Minneapolis Fed, which says that I believe that even if we had been able to identify all the shocks in advance, I don't think our workhorse model, so I think he's been, he thinks about the new condition uh, model, would have come anywhere close to forecasting 7% inflation. Okay. So <clears throat> we need somehow uh, amplification mechanism, okay, that the uh, new Keynesian model doesn't have. And so uh, this is where I think uh, Ivan and Guido's uh, contribute by focusing on two potential amplification mechanisms. One is a de anchoring of inflation expectation. And this is something that is very important in the Fed narrative. And you know, it's uh, very often said that uh, uh, long run uh, inflation expectation uh, remains uh, anchored. Uh, and the other uh, potential amplification mechanism is the wedge, uh, the potential wedge price uh, spiral. And again, this is also something that is very much uh, emphasized uh, in what the Fed says about, uh, you know, uh, the motivation of uh, its policy decision or the criteria that uh, that uh, they take a look at. Okay, so and there is this idea that we need to lower wage inflation to lower core inflation. 
Okay. So let me uh, discuss, you know, organize the discussion on these two uh, themes. And let me start with uh, the anchoring of uh, inflation expectation. Okay, so the <clears throat> usually uh, one, when one try to address uh, potential the anchoring of inflation expectation, one looks at so-called long-run inflation expectation. Okay, and the idea is that this long-run inflation expectation is something that is going to anchor the new Fed, the new Keynesian Phillips curve. And so you can, you know, I mean, this is an expression that, that is uh, found in the, this paper by Azaler and Noel and Stenson, where they show that, you know, the long run inflation expectation has a direct impact on, 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 on expectation, on, on inflation today, okay? So of course, if you start to have something that drift up to, you say, 4%, then you can have 4% inflation too, okay? And so if you look at the data, um, and this is, you know, the measure of long-run expectation from various agents, either um, uh, households uh, in blue, that's from the Michigan, uh, markets based in, in, in yellow, and, and uh, from survey of professional forecasters, those are, you know, five years in five years measure of, inf of inflation expectation. You see that you know they are relatively well encored. So you see some increase in the market measures and household measures, but you know this increase actually uh, uh, they are. Uh, I mean, they, those they, they brought back those measures so from when they were from when they were pre pre Great Recession. So you, you might say they have re-encored to a level that was cons more consistent with a two percent uh, inflation level. Um, Okay, so that's 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 the optimistic view uh, uh, about uh, inflation anchor. So Ivan's uh, paper, um, you know, uh, takes a different route and says and question that you know, looking at this number is is informative about the role of uh, inflation expectations on, on the impact of, on on change in inflation expectation or the anchoring of inflation expectation can have on, on, on inflation realizations. Okay, so it does that by relaxing the constraint that inflation expectations are driven by a sequence of future output gaps, which is what the new Keynesian setup uh, usually does. <clears throat> and it shows that the pass-through of expectations, inflation expectation shocks, you can think of this as, you know, uh, the anchoring, pure belief shocks, to prices is very dependent on the pricing model. So it's going to be close to one in the Calvo model. It's close to one half uh, with Taylor. <clears throat> can also be zero, uh, for instance, uh, in, CD, in, in um, SS models, where you have a cost of changing in action bands, uh, that's going to be zero, unless you have a very large inflation expectation shock that can then affect prices. And actually, this is something <laughs> uh, that is quite consistent with some empirical evidence that we have on households uh, uh, impact uh, on how in household inflation expectation can impact their durable consumption choices. And we find in a, in a recent paper by, uh, uh, I mean, with, that is co-authors with uh, Erwan Gauthier and, and Eric Mengus that only uh, uh, change in regime of inflation expectation affect uh, household durable swing. And also in general, what uh, Ivan shows is that uh, the, the pass-through of inflation expectation uh, uh, to shocks to prices declines rapidly with the horizon and, and, and the limit for very long horizon is zero. Okay, so there's two implications. First of all, the, the amplifying role of inflation expectation on inflation is quite unclear because it depends on the models of pricing that you have. And you know, if anything, central banks, when they want to assess whether there's a risk of the anchoring, whether the anchoring is something that is driving the increase in inflation in inflation realization, they should look at short-run inflation expectations rather than, than longer. So let's have a look at short-run inflation expectations. So what did they do recently? Do we see, you know, uh, some form of evidence that there is, you know, uh, some de anchoring shocks uh, that, that are there uh, and then they can be observed in short term inflation expectation. So here I'm looking at uh, how uh, one year ahead inflation expectations of, uh, of uh, households evolved uh, as a function of uh, the, you know, the past, the latest uh, realization of inflation that is available when the survey is conducted. And so you have that for different uh, 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 periods. And so in red, this is what happened 
uh, after COVID, so over the 2021-2023 period. And you see that those points are pretty well aligned to uh, on the on the, the the regression line that is you know uh, actually that we that you get if you uh, do the mapping in between uh, inflation expectations of households and, and, and inflation realizations over a period where it was uh, anchored, which is 2008-2020. Okay, so there's no overreaction of inflation expectation compared to, to inflation realization. So there's, you know, uh, households take the same signal from the uh, recent uh, increase in inflation uh, than, than, than usual, okay? Okay, so that's that's for the first uh, <clears throat> potential uh, amplification mechanism. So yeah, we said there's no clear evidence that that it's there. And now let's have a look at the second uh, amplification mechanism, uh, which is uh, those wedge price files. Okay, so here I'm showing you how uh, wages measured by this employment cost index uh, uh, evolve together with uh, core PC. Okay, so, uh, and you see that over the recent period, there's a really a, you know, a jump of the two measures. Okay, so there is very strong positive correlation between core uh, aggregate inflation and wage inflation. And of course, the question is, do we need, you know, we want to get the, the red line closer to something like 2%. So do we need to have, uh, you know, a drop in, uh, in uh, wage inflation, okay? And here, uh, I think uh, Widows and Evans paper uh, provide, uh, I think, interesting insights, uh, very interesting insights. So what they do, and I'm gonna focus mostly here on what uh, Evans uh, presented at, at the very end, what they show is that there is, a, you know, in a standard new Keynesian model where you have, <clears throat> Uh, both price stickiness and wage stickiness, a la Erseg and Larson Levin. Uh, there's a conflict bet between firms and workers and workers uh, when they're firms fixing prices and, and workers fixing uh, wages. Okay. And so as a result, wage price parallels exist uh, in this standard new Canadian setup whenever the uh, you know the aspiration of uh, uh, workers and 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 um, and uh, firms about the real wage differ. And this is something that is that appears every you know as soon as there is a difference between uh, the margin, marginal product of labor and the mar marginal rest uh, of substitution between uh, uh, labor and consumption. Okay, and so so to speak, you can think of this as you know whenever you're uh, you know outside whenever output is different from the natural uh, level of output then then you're going to get this uh, wedge price power okay so let me skip the the next uh, uh, bullet points uh, I, i'm not so sure that they, uh, they provide a very clear intuition of what is going on in the model uh, you know uh, clearer than what Ivan said but let me emphasize some results uh, <clears throat> there's lots more in the paper some results that i found interesting or important uh, in in the in that paper. So first of all, the real wage can decline even if the spiral spiral is at play. So you know it's not because you have a decline in the real wage that there's no spiral. Another thing that is also important and and events uh, underlined that is that uh, you can have situations where at the same time you have positive wage inflation, or you can think of this as wage inflation above target. And, and, and inflation and positive aggregate inflation or goods uh, inflation without any de okay? So it's not, uh, I mean, it's not clear that it's really uh, something that uh, signals that the economy is, uh, you know, going uh, to a new uh, <coughs> uh, inflation target that is not controlled by the central bank. And then something that even did not have time to discuss, uh, there's you know, uh, some discussion of what is the optimal monetary policy uh, in the setup. And they show that it can be optimal for the monetary policy to run the economy out for some time. So as a, a, a desired decline in the real wage, depending on the shock that is driving uh, that you consider, a de desired decline in the real wage can happen with some increases in uh, nominal wages. Okay, so somehow 
sometimes it's good to exploit the wage price uh, spiral. Uh, you know, there's some uh, you know, uh, interest for the monetary policy, the central bank to exploit that that uh, that spiral. And so the paper, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, the conflict paper uh, with Guido is somehow. Yeah, as Ivan said, it's a, it's a generalization of, of uh, you know, this, uh, this more specific paper where you have more general firms and worker aspirations. Okay, so I, I have, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things there. I think it's a very stimulating approach. The only thing, I mean, I, I'd like to comment is, <clears throat> so should we think of this as uh particularly responsible for the recent inflation surge, you know? So does the conflict uh, in inflation, the conflict approach to inflation explain where, you know, what's going on uh, these days? And so, okay, yeah, it's very tentative and uh, very speculative. And so I thought you know, maybe one thing that is specific uh, during the period, and that might be related to the conflict, is this, uh, you know, increased in firm margin that has been discussed uh, quite, quite, uh, I mean, Quite often, and this is what you see here on the on this chart. So in the, on this chart, I'm showing the you know the corporate profit of uh, as a share of GDP and firm margins comp uh, uh, computed uh, from the computer data, and you see that there is you know after COVID there is an increase, um, which as is well documented you know follows a trend increase. So my question is you know uh, if you take these measures as a crude measures of, you know, uh, uh, more or less conflict. Uh, um, you might think that, okay, so there is a reason why there's more inflation today, which is because, you know, firms had uh, aspirations that increased a lot. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you can see that you have also a period before where inflation was very, you know, was very low. And firms' uh, margins and profit also increased quite a lot. So I was wondering what you know what is specific this time that is related to conflict, and maybe Philip? and again and again. So that's Philip, my last. Sorry slide. To... Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so we're running out of time. So if you could. Okay, sorry. So the, maybe what what one way to think about you know what is specific there and that could be related to conflict is that this time there's a lot of uh, sectoral differences, okay? And here I'm plotting the evolution of margins from computer data, that's uh, from an ongoing work with uh, Boring, Philat, and Joachim at the uh, Boston Fed. You see that <clears throat> margins of uh, goods sectors increased a lot, whereas margins of service sectors declined. And so maybe, you know, what is specific this time is that you have large sectoral shocks uh, that, you know, have started to uh, drive conflict at the sectoral level. And this is, you know, why you have this surge in inflation. I don't know. I mean, that's really, as I was saying, it's just complete speculation. There. So let me wrap up. Uh, I think uh, those are important papers with, with important policy implications. As uh, <clears throat> Ivan said, the effect of inflation expectation on inflation is uncertain. Uh, inflation expectations, other than changing in change uh, in regime, might not matter so much for inflation realization. Lowering uh, uh, inflation, wage inflation, is not necessarily a precondition for bringing uh, inflation uh, back to target. And then I think there is this very stimulating conflict view of inflation, which calls for uh, you know empirical works, um, <clears throat> and and we would like to know how much of the conflict account for recent uh, the recent inflation surge and more generally how it contributes to you know inflation general. Uh, realization in general. And I think, uh, you know, all those papers uh, make the, you know, that are, <clears throat> that come up with the recent episode uh, help us to make progress in our understanding in inflation. And those are, you know, very important inputs, uh, in particular for the next review of the Fed monetary policy strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Ivan, if you want to take two to three minutes to respond to the discussion, and then I can open the Q&A session. Perfect. I'll set a timer to make sure I understand what three minutes is. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much. I think uh, Philippe had an impossible task here. Honestly, I felt guilty. And every slide he has, I want to, you know, dive into more. Um, hope to be able to talk to you, Philippe, more about it. Um, a couple of points uh, just to... Um, you know, I think if I think of 
looking at the recent evidence on inflation expectations and what they did, I think even people who think the pass through is high do not think inflation expectation had much of a role. So even a Jason Furman who uses fee of one, you know, here's the thing, like everyone uses fee of one. If you, if you see a blog post, fee of one, if you see a Fed president, you know, a speech implicitly, there's a fee of one somewhere. Um, but even then, people think inflation expectation didn't rise enough on the path that we were to explain inflation. I'm very much in agreement with that. Um, but the point is, it was used a little bit as a boogeyman for uh, first for saying, okay, we don't have to worry. And then for saying we have to worry because the cat's going to get out of the bag. And so I think for those counterfactuals, we have to think a lot about fee. And unfortunately, it's not so easy to figure out um, purely empirically, especially not purely just looking at what's happened. Uh, there's great, you know, more experimental evidence uh, from the team by uh, Gorichenko, Koibon, and, 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 and others um, that might, might eventually give us those answers. Not yet, I think. All right. So um, I think uh, another interesting thing was your discussion of conflict and, and profit margins, just to pick one other thing. Uh, and, um, and there I want to say, make, make very clear, very clear, especially you can see it because since I mapped any model into that, it's not a model that's saying inflation was greed or profit margins as people oversimplify things. Um, and in fact, I, I, as a pure measurement issue, I think it's tricky to look at these profit margins because in our model, for example, um, no, there's no shock to markups or profit, uh, desired profit margins, but there is this supply constraint. And I think if that's happening internally in the firm with some kind of fixed factor, uh, you would see measure is measured high profit margins. But in terms of how we think as economists, that's like the price of the factor, the scarce factor is going up a lot. And it's not, it's not necessarily the same thing. So there's that issue. The other issue that you asked, why now, not before, uh, even taking into account the first point I made, um, I wanna stress another thing that's clear in our model is it, monetary policy still always matters. Um, so you always have to think about, let's say markups, desired markups want to go up or something, but you know, that will produce inflation, uh, if, if you're targeting the same output, but not necessarily if that happens slowly enough and you, and, and somehow you adjusted monetary policy accordingly. So, um, it's not so easy, you know, it's, you always have to have more than one variable. Basically, we know that as macroeconomists, <laughs> um, all right, so, and then the sectoral margins, completely agree, I've done work in different sectors. I think the sectoral stuff is super important for the recent events. Um, and it's interesting to think about those sectoral margins. I had not looked at that. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Uh, so maybe I'll open the Q&A session and we'll have some time for to answer some questions. So. Um, there's a question from the audience. Uh, they're wondering what happens when price adjustment follows Rottenberg. And maybe a follow up on that would be what if firms switch between pricing models with some probability, say Calvo or Taylor, uh, would the solution for inflation then have a phi or a pass through between 0.5 and 1? Thank you, thank you. And let me just at the outset say if people have more questions and we don't get there, email me, happy to respond. Um, Rottenberg, I'm doing that. I, I, my, my conjecture is it's near one. I, I'm, I'm going to do that because I've gotten this question a lot and, and confirm that, uh, but I haven't done it to be honest. So that's my conjecture to be checked because, you know, things I thought in the past have turned out to be different when I do them. Um, it's a great question. If firms are switching, yeah, I expect you'll get something in between. I'm going to use that question to highlight something else, which is, I think it's very hard to look at the data and know if it's Taylor or, or Calvo. We, um, we, you know, and I think no one, I haven't read the paper that says title, how much is Calvo, how much is Taylor, that'd be great. But it's also hard because if you just look at the data and you see that spells are not always the same length. That doesn't mean that when firms, uh, for example, because an alternative is it's always Taylor, but every time they set the price, they, they set a stopwatch and they know how long it's going to take until the next price change. And that would be like a time varying Taylor that's going to look a little, if, since you don't know, it's going to look like it's random. But for the firm, it's, it, it's a problem of the econometrician. Kind of 
So I, I'm using the question for something else, but I, I think there's a, a lot of challenges and a lot of interesting questions to dig into and start thinking. Basically, I think the literature is focused way too much on frequency and maybe jump to menu cost, which is hard, but has not thought a lot about you know, the shapes of, of uh, or enough about how these shapes matter and, and how we really can tell. Maybe I'll, I'll follow up with a, with a question on that. So what I think is particularly powerful, right, is showing that this pass-through can, de can depend on the pricing model, right, or the data generating process per se. So it's not the universal, right, so the pass-through is, is not universal. But then we know from, you know, a number of firm surveys in other countries, unfortunately not for the U.S. yet, we know that we have some estimates, right, that we can rely on, on causal effects from inflation expectations into pricing decisions. So could we maybe think of that as being an additional selective tool, um, right, or, or an, an additional moment to, um, you know, to select the appropriate model? I love that question. Ina, if you have papers I need to read, let me know. I don't think there's a lot of clear cut uh, effects of inflation expectation on inflation that, that get to the bottom of it. I review a little bit what I think is very promising approaches and maybe you have that in mind. Um, so for example, if you take uh, the QJE paper, uh, is it Kumar Goichenko Koibon? Um, yeah, that's sorry. one of the papers I have. Random mind. order there. It's it's really about employment, that paper mainly, but if you look at the tables on pricing that they have, you can see that fee is around 0.2. It's really low. But that's like, you know, the problem with that, and I think they they, they know that, I've talked to them, um, that is that it's not just inflation expectations that's changing. You know, if we, when firms suddenly think inflation expectations are going to be higher, for example, although in their sample, I think it goes the other way because firms didn't realize there would be deflation and the euro crisis. But, you know, but if, they, if firms think this inflation is going to be higher, they might not worry. They might worry that there's going to be a recession because they have things upside down or because they anticipate the Fed's going to tighten a lot. Um, and in fact, you do see the other expectations moving. So I think it's a little difficult and we need more work there. I think they have an amazing paper that has two instruments. But they use that to think about expected ex invariance. But if you start having more instruments, potentially you could start conditioning. So instead of using that to look at first and second moments, you could do it to think about holding constant output expectations and and for, you know um, that hasn't been done yet. And and you know I think it's enormously challenging because two might roughly get there, but you need to like to control the whole path. Um, so it's tricky. I hope we can get there, but currently I feel very um, much appreciative of what's been done, but I do think there is a gap. And I'm trying to provide what the theory says um, and at least to, so we don't automatically knee jerk in blogs or in central bank uh, uh, speeches, assume it's one. We acknowledge we don't know. <laughs> and yes, hopefully we can we can do it we figure this out cleverly, either by directly measuring it, or maybe we'll take a micro to macro approach. We'll directly measure enough things that the micro model, figure out the model and figure it out. Uh, but I think either approach, you know, time will tell. So I think my view is, again, the humbleness point that, you know, maybe it's a little disconcerting, but I think we should always know what we don't know. And, and that's more knowledge. And I think we don't know enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, but we started, you know, the paper tells you what it depends on. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's where I fall on that. And, you know, my gut, I'll give you my intuition, is that in the US, inflation didn't pick up because firms were getting ahead of inflation. They were catching up. I'd love someone to sort of try and measure that. But basically, someone who thinks expectations matter really thinks that firms are getting ahead or if workers are getting ahead. And yeah, that my gut. So that's, that's a gut separated from the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm skeptical. Okay. Um, another question regarding the uh, stylized model. Why isn't the buyer acting as a monopsonist offsetting the monopoly power of the seller? Thank you. In the, in the style, super stylized model, 
the price is already set. So the buyer can only choose the quantities. So it really looks like a regular buyer walking in, seeing prices and choosing how much to buy. It's just that when they go to the cashier, they pay and they're good. Um, even though they're monopsonist with respect to payment, by now it looks like a, 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 a you know, regular monopoly facing a demand curve. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the answer. Now in the model, then they switch places later. So they exert their power again. And so that is happening and that's what's producing the escalation and the inflation. Um, again, I can't stress enough that that's a super stylized model where things are altering deterministically. You know, I actually think the nice thing about uh, the Ursa et al is it's sort of a smooth version of that where no one's getting really ahead as a group um, and things are much smoother. And it's just, I think, um, and so you won't ever see me exerting a ton of power um, as in the stylist model, but I think in, in both cases, you get the same idea that it's this conflict or this agreement on relative prices uh, that's driving inflation. Um, and maybe we can get to, to the final uh, question. So how does nonlinearity of the Phillips curve relate to conflict? Perhaps precisely when supply constraints are most binding, demand shock produces higher inflation through the conflict channel. If so, that suggests that the conflict components add um, adds nonlinearity in the new Keynesian Phillips curve? I will say yes and no. Let me try and have it both ways. So I think, again, the conflict is a framework that lives above it. So you can write a model that has that property just uh, stated. And I think in that way, it's freeing. And now you can think of that property. For example, here's a model. Once I understand the conflict part, I could say that workers are not gonna wake up when they have to work a few more hours. But if they start getting pushed to having to cancel their vacations or, you know, so there can be a nonlinearity there. And I think, you know, the, in fairness, the post-Gainesian literature is really all about that, that there's this range where things are very flat. Um, and you have to go, to think about that, I think it's useful that, you do have to, I think it's helpful at least to move away from thinking that labor supply is about marginal disutilities of labor in a competitive market or something close to that. And thinking about how, you know, maybe bargaining is only gonna, or I'm only gonna reset my wage if it's big enough and start thinking maybe institutions matter there or, or so on. So that freedom does lead to maybe explore those things, but it's not necessarily the case. In fact, let me push that idea further you can write a model where if you lower demand, okay, maybe it makes labor unions really angry that now employment's fallen and the remaining people who have a job might be the most, you know, uh, willing to, to strike or the most willing to, uh, or, or, you know, at, now, at this point, you know, it's a political effect even, et cetera, et cetera. Look what's happening in France. Um, you know, so when you include that in your ideas, that could lead you to something actually that if you lower output and employment, you might get more inflation because you might create this conflict. And so I think it's incredibly liberating. I wouldn't just say it allows you to think of nonlinearities, but it doesn't tie you down to any one of them, but it's, it can lead you to other, other, other effects. And unfortunately it's a wilderness. We need to explore them. I don't wanna say I know which one is right, but I think having this umbrella is useful and you don't have to throw anything away. If you want to stay with the Nucasian model and use this conflict to think about it, but it also is helpful for thinking about other things. Great. Unfortunately, we're going to have to, to conclude. I think that we're, you know, well, 20 minutes um, beyond the scheduled time. Uh, thank you so much, Ivan, for the great insights presentation. And thank you so much, Philip, for the great discussion. This has been, um, you know, a great webinar session. And of course, thanks to the organizers for putting it together. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you also from my side, you know, for this amazing presentation and delineating the boundaries of what we know and what we don't know and uh, the excellent discussion and, and the moderation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.